talking today is about a paper that is being written, it is work in progress with a few people, uh, Jordan Kotler, Stefan Prohaska, Max Reigler, Jakob Salzer, and uh, let's kick it off. Um, so this is a talk about flat space quantum gravity. And where we're going to is, is three-dimensional gravity, but bear with me for a little bit. I'd like to talk about uh, four-dimensional gravity first to explain the name soft gravitons that appears in the title. So consider your favorite theory of you know, four-dimensional gravity coupled to matter, standard model coupled to GRs, effective field theory of some Calabi-Yau compactification, whatever. There are robust results in the infrared limit of the observables of such a theory, the scattering amplitudes um, that go, well, worth discussing. So I've drawn a picture here of some process involving n plus one particles to find all the momenta to be going out. Um, and the yellow line is special. It's a graviton uh, with some polarization epsilon mu nu and some four vector q mu that squares to zero. And the, the robust result that I have in mind today is that if you take a certain infrared limit of the scattering amplitude, take the momentum of that uh, yellow graviton to be very, very small, um, equivalent meaning take the frequency to be very, very small, um, then this n plus one particle scattering amplitude, say two particles in, two particles out, plus the graviton as an example, is actually related to the n particle scattering amplitude by some proportionality factors um, that I've written here. I have some form. Um, the, if you were to write these in a small momentum expansion, uh, the first one is order one over omega, the second is order omega, and the dots are vanishing as omega tends to zero. Okay, what are these results? Where do they come from? Well, the first term here, the order one over omega thing, this is known as the soft graviton theorem. This was demonstrated by Weinberg quite some time ago. <laughs> um, as for the second, the second is a more recent result proven by uh, a few folks written here in 2014, uh, including Kajazo and Strominger, Geyer, Lipstein, Mason, and White. Um, and it's known as the subleading soft graviton theorem. It's subleading in the sense of uh, compared to the first term in a small energy expansion. Um, and I should have said that you know, what I'm talking about now is tree level amplitudes will talk, discuss loop corrections shortly. Um, yes, go ahead, Anton. I have a possibly stupid question. So why did it take 50 years to get from uh, just <laughs> nobody was interested or is it a lot more difficult or what's... Uh... Uh, it's a combination of uh, the, the second term being more difficult, um, but also... Well, uh, interest, as you say, interest, as I understand it. You know, isn't there some claim? Sorry, Kristen. Isn't there some claims that the young Mills equivalent of this was actually known by Fadeyev and Coolidge? Yes. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, the I'm. Yes, I want to get to three D gravity, so I'm having to suppress my uh, my introduction here a little bit. But absolutely, uh, Julian. There's a. Uh, you know, this, 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 uh, these results have an analog in gauge theory where they were related to textbook things, you know, things that appear in an introductory field course in terms of that they had foolish, as you said, uh, infrared divergences in gauge theories. Um, you know, what, it, what exactly is the, the right external states that one should be considering in amplitudes and so on. This is the gravitational analog of that. The subleading thing, though, is um, it's analog how to say it, it, it has an analog in gauge theory, but uh, an imperfect analog, I would say. 
Um, the reason, okay, so we can say, say now why these things have the name soft graviton theorem, subleading, soft, subleading is clear, but what, what is soft? What is soft is the energy. Uh, these gravitons, this, this yellow line here, so it has lower and lower energy becomes softer and softer, more and more infrared. Sorry, Kinson, I actually thought that the whole, whole point, at least what I learned from those 2014 papers, that they wanted somehow to relate this to uh, BPZ kind of Verasara. Yeah, yeah, yeah. On We're getting the, there. They call what they call this uh, in the, the sphere, sphere in the infinity. Yeah, that that's exactly that's where we're that's where we're going in this introduction. That is something that Weinberg did not think about, of course. That that's right. So okay, okay, so I can say. So okay, the there in, indeed these results. You know, Weinberg's result was very nice. It was some universal result, but why it is uh, the relation? Well, it's on account of some symmetry. What's the symmetry? Well, we'll discuss shortly. Um, but those symmetries indeed are sort of, uh, you know, this is why it uh, was one of the motivations for Pichazzo, Strominger, the other 2014 papers to uncover this. And it does, yes, I was going to comment on this, that it leads to some Virasoro like word of endies. You guys are doing great. You're anticipating all the, the direction of the talk <laughs> beautifully. Um, so, so, I, so far I was just discussing tree level amplitudes. Uh, what about loops? And it turns out the leading term is tree level exact. There are no loop corrections to it in all orders in G Newton, um, or for that matter, in uh, terms of you know uh, self interactions and so on. Um, as far as the subleading soft term, that one receives a one loop correction. However, it's been shown to be that that uh, you know there's. That it's one loop exact. There's no corrections in two loops and, and it higher and so on. Um, if you see this, you should wonder why on earth that's the case. And the natural guess that you might make is that you know, these results are on account of some symmetry somehow. And indeed, that is, that is correct. These were, what's the symmetry? Um, well, uh, let me introduce something uh, that some of you may have heard about before, the notion of an asymptotic symmetry group, which is appropriate when discussing uh, symmetries of a gauge theory on a space with boundary, where you have, in this case, some notion of infinity. So we're talking about flat space quantum gravity, it means we're looking at you know, fluctuations of fields around empty space. So there's the Penrose diagram for flat space. What are asymptotic symmetries? Well, these are, in, in the case at hand, diffeomorphisms that, you know, the, the, the resulting metric perturbation that ensues respects the boundary conditions that you want to have, in this case, asymptotic flatness. Um, so these include, you know, large diffeomorphisms, things that can act all the way out to infinity. Uh, modulo diffeomorphisms that die off at infinity. That's the asymptotic symmetry group. These are things that act non-trivially on the Hilbert space of states and observables of, uh, of your theory, in this case, in the S matrix. So if you write the metric of 40 flat space as you know this plus dots that are appropriately subleading in a large R expansion, um, here U is like a, a, a null coordinate that runs along future null infinity. R is a coordinate that runs out there, um, and Z and Z bar parameterize the, their, you know, you stereographically project the sphere at constant radius to Z, Z bar to the plane. And, you know, there's a, a seminal analysis of BMS back in the day that was revisited rather recently in the last decade by Barnage and Chaucer. Um, showing that, well, what is this uh, asymptotic symmetry group? Well, it's quite large. You might have thought it's just Poincaré. It's finite dimensional. It's translations and boosts and rotations, and that's all she wrote. But that's not the case. There's an infinite dimensional as set of diffeomorphisms that can act at infinity and respect the boundary conditions. Um, they include a part that I wrote in the first line here. That's, that's the part due to BMS. And then, uh, which you know, you can think of as U gets translated by some function on the sphere, 
plus stuff. Um, and then, well, there's a second line that involves a reparameterization of the sphere itself. This was realized more recently. Um, the first set, the things involving what I'm calling F, are super translations. You ask, well, where's the ordinary translations? You know, X goes to X plus something. Um, they're included as a you know, four-dimensional subgroup of the super translations. As for the super, the, the this this much wider class reparameterizations of the sphere, those are called super rotations, and they include the familiar uh, Lorentz group SO three comma one. And you know, if you track what are these are some uh, you know symmetries, they relate S matrix elements to each other because they act in infinity. So you know that you don't divide by these things under the path integral over metrics. Um, there should be corresponding word identities associated with them. And indeed, the soft theorem you can think of as the super translation word identity and the subleading soft theorem as the super rotation word identity. Well, can I ask a question about this uh, B, uh, BMS and uh, the future sphere? Yes. So I would believe that if gauge was properly fixed in the theory of gravity, and if we put proper boundary conditions and so on, there should not be an infinite dimensional symmetry uh, because we, we, we broke it by boundary conditions and gauge fixing. But what is the just kind of conceptual explanation why we still have infinite dimensional symmetry <clears throat> We did, um, this, we, we did not properly quantize it or where did it come from? No, 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 no. Um, I mean, uh, let's see. So I can say I can say some words now that are, are correct words to answer it, but let me, um, I think whether or not you like the words, hold on. We're, we're going to transition to three dimensions where you can really see very mechanically what's what's going on there there's also an infinite dimensional symmetry and you can see uh the physics of it um Chris Dan, yeah one, one clarifying remark might be samson if you think about ads3 and you think about ads cft you yes. know that boundary has to have an infinite dimensional symmetry vera soro and this is the natural symmetry group that you get as the, the, the kind of caution that Kristen said here. It's the diffeomorphisms via the boundary preserving diffeomorphisms, basically. Right. And it's infinite dimensional because it's Virasoro in ADS3. Here, okay, I'm asking, I mean, I'm asking? Well, one way of saying it is that um, I'll have to say. So, first off, you know, you look, you gauge fix, you, uh, you know, you run through the apparatus, and this is still left behind. What gives? What this is saying is that there are many boundary conditions that are for the metric at infinity that are, you know, they're, uh, they're gauge equivalent to each other, but under large diffeomorphisms, not under small ones. So you, these lead to different states, in and out states, that are related to each other by symmetry. But they're not, you know, they're they're different states. They're not gauge equivalent to each other. What I would say is that these are different backgrounds. So you're actually what when you do this transformation, yeah. you don't keep. You're not in the same scattering. You actually are relating different scattering amplitudes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that's what the soft graviton theorem does. It relates a background where you have a little bit of soft graviton to one where there's not. So the, it relates different backgrounds by this transformation. So this is yes. not. A symmetry on one amplitude or something. So it's that's right. It's a symmetry that relates all the different amplitudes to each other. That's exactly right. Analogous to in conformal field theory, how insertions of stress tensor get related to correlation functions without a stress tensor insertion. The keyword is that because we agreed on this, the next statement is that this transformation somehow uh, 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 gives you a word identity. Which is not a global symmetry of the theory because at the infinity in, in this theory, global symmetry is a Poincare group, period. There is nothing else. Because global symmetry is something which is a, a statement about Lorentz group and so on at, at no. infinity. 
This is some other, it's not even a symmetry. It relates one object to another object. No, 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 no. The, the statement is, uh, the statement is, we'll see this viscerally in three dimensions. The statement is that, if you will, the evolution operator is invariant, but the in and out states get transformed under these thank charges. You. Thank you. That's, that's, that's a better way to, to yeah, thank you. Yeah, yeah. Um, right. And then since we talked about uh, briefly, since Samson mentioned there's some uh, BPZ like thing, um, there's a whole recent program of other people, uh, mostly related, you know, academic children of Andy Strominger, um, called the Celestial CFT program, which builds upon these results, which builds upon soft graviton theorem, subleading soft graviton theorem. What they do, what they're doing in essence, is they're rewriting, you know, scattering amplitudes of, you know, three plus one d gravity coupled to matter um, as correlation functions, things that look like correlation functions on the spirit infinity. And well, we're basically, you know, particles coming in and out of null infinity, you keep track of where those, they uh, enter and exit on the sphere. And that's how you get points on the sphere. And then the soft and subleading theorems, those become, well, the subleading ones anyway, become conformal word identities uh, for those correlation functions with a stress tensor that is constructed from the super rotation charges. You get BPZ like equations, as was said, from the super so subleading soft graviton theorem. Um, this, so it looks like you have a uh, conformal field theory description of uh, 40 scattering amplitudes, which is very interesting. Um, so far, I think it's been rewriting. I, I'm not aware of genuinely new results that have come uh, that you, you know, understand something new about gravity coupled to matter this way. Um, it suggests, well, maybe there's some dual description in terms of uh, two-dimensional two conformal field theory that describes that that's a completely equivalent to 40 gravity. Um, I'm not going to talk about that today. I just want to, you know, the, I made this a parenthetical comment. If you've heard the word celestial CFT, this is the context for that program. Um, the thing that I really want to emphasize for today is that in four dimensions, these soft gravitons, they're, you know, they're generated by large diffeomorphisms. And, you know, so far there hasn't been like a direct path integral treatment of these modes as of yet, you know, you want, uh, you find some modes of the theory, you'd like to have a path integral for them, integrate over them, diagrammatic expansion for them, all those kinds of lovely things that doesn't exist yet. The existing approaches to these problems, the, the proof, for instance, the, of Weinberg's soft graviton theorem or the more, more tedious proof of the subleading one, you know, those are using standard diagrammatics and uh, as appropriate to uh, canonical formalism. Uh, you, you take a Cauchy slice, a constant time slice, and push it out to null infinity, where, you know, your creation annihilation operators, your, your free field expansion basically is, is quite good. That's the idea. Those, that's the, those have been the tools on the market so far. Um, and the question that in light of that, that I would like to ask today is if there's analogous results to these in lower space-time dimension. Naively, you might say no, because there's no such thing as a propagating graviton in less than four dimensions. Um, however, that's too fast. That's a naive answer. It's a wrong one. I'm setting it up as the thing to knock over. Um, we know of a couple of counterexamples uh, without thinking too hard. One is in two dimensions. There is a funny theory of, uh, you know, ordinary gravity in two dimensions. Einstein Hilbert is topological, so you need to do something more. If you consider a theory of so-called dilaton gravity, with, where there's a dilaton phi, and with a gravitational action that looks like, uh, looks like this, sometimes called JT prime, reasons I could explain. Um, this is a theory of topological gravity. The dilaton there sets the curvature to zero. It's a theory of flat metrics. And if you couple it to matter, you might think that that um, you know, does nothing. But a careful computation by Dubosky, Garbenko, uh, Mirbiai shows that, well, actually, this, this coupling to flat metrics produces a dressing to the S matrix. If you look at you know, scattering amplitudes, 
um, you get some momentum dependent uh, phase shifts. And in fact, those phase shifts are precisely equal to what one finds in the TT bar deformation of that same field theory that you are coupling into this theory of topological gravity. So there's an instance where you don't have propagating gravitons, but you do have deformation of the S matrix. You have boundary gravitons there. Maybe another way is another way of saying it. <clears throat> um, another example, and the one that we'll focus on today, is that of uh, three space-time dimensions. There, as Julian said, if you have not zero cosmological constant, then there are boundary gravitons, and there's some infinite dimensional asymptotic symmetry group. Um, if we're, we're in ADS, that asymptotic symmetry group is two copies of your Osoro. And if you're in flat space, it has been known that there is an infinite dimensional asymptotic symmetry that has been dubbed BMS3. BMS had nothing to do with it. They never considered three dimensions, but you know, sort of in the way that, um, well, uh, well, anyway, yeah. So sometimes people get credit for, get named for things that uh, are long past their time. Um, so we're going to focus, inspired by all this, on three-dimensional flat space gravity. And we want to kind of understand, you know, for this talk, basic questions. Are there, you know, analogs of soft gravitons in three-dimensional gravity? If there are, is there some quantum field theory description of these things that we can uncover? Are there soft graviton theorems associated with them, which thereby constrain the S matrix of 3D gravity coupled to matter? And you know, ultimately, the aim of, of this project is to, to gain some insight into the path integral treatment of these modes, which maybe we can export up to four dimensions. That's the long-term hope. I have nothing to say about that other than today, other than to say that that's the hope. Any questions before we go on? Yeah. Hi, Kristen. I have a question. Um, I always thought that you know one of the reasons why 3D gravity is interesting in ADS is because you have black hole solutions or, or, or right. cosmologies if you're in DS. In flat space, you don't have that, right? But I mean, there's there's flat space cosmologies, but yeah, there's it's. I agree, it's a much more empty theory than in ADS. But you're saying there's still. I mean, do you have to couple your theory of gravity to matter for the story to be interesting, or is there? Is there a story to tell just for pure really flat space gravity? So what we're going to do, we're going to tackle the pure flat space 3D gravity and just, you know, once and for all. And the result is going to be, you know, boring, but kind of boring in an interesting way. Um, <laughs> It gets it. I mean, it, it it's much more interesting with matter. So interesting that actually we we're still uh, wrestling trying to figure it out. Get on board with that. <laughs> yeah. Thanks. By the way, Kristen, we prefer that a lot to interesting in a boring way. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. I'm. <laughs> um, no. Yeah. 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 Okay, so where are we going from here? Well, we, we gave some introduction talking about soft gravitons and four dimensions, blah, blah. What I'm going to do next is to collect some useful known facts about 3D gravity and flat space. We'll quantize a field theory of boundary gravitons, and we'll end with some pictures for what's going on with soft theorems. Okay, so let's begin with some useful results in two plus one dimensional gravity. The first uh, concerns the asymptotic symmetry group of flat space gravity. Um, so if we start off again with empty flat space, Penrose diagram there, metric with outgoing Bondi coordinates uh, written here. Um, well, that, that's the vacuum. And of course, when we integrate over metrics, we integrate over more general things than just empty space. Um, more generally, we sum over metrics that obey certain boundary conditions as one approaches infinity. And if you write out the appropriate ones for three-dimensional gravity, they're uh, what's written here. You know, you have a UU term, U is the uh, outgoing null coordinate that does uh, order one as R becomes very large, and so on. Um, the first uh, thing that one finds if you solve Einstein's equation subject to these boundary conditions is that while well, there's an infinite dimensional phase space of metrics that respect them. 
And furthermore, that phase space is generated by an infinite dimensional asymptotic symmetry group acting on the flat space vacuum. So acting on empty space and generating this uh, very, very large phase space of metrics. And again, they're not gauge equivalent to each other because the asymptotic symmetries, the things that map you from one space time to the other, act at infinity. What are these, what's the space space of metrics? Well, um, it looks like this, it's, it's quite simple. Um, there's a du squared term, function of theta in front. Um, this is a typo, should be du d theta. Um, and then, oh, I had another typo, minus two. Okay, not that anyone else cares probably. There's two functions of theta that appear characterizing the most general uh, on shell metric that respects these boundary conditions. And what are the two functions? Well, one of them you can take to sit in front of u, u. It's like a null energy. Um, and the other appears in u theta. This function j that I've written there, um, it's an integration constant, little j of theta, plus something that depends on null time, but in a way that's fixed by the u, u component. So there's two functions of theta. Um, here, there, this is one of them, P, and the other is J, they characterize such an on shell metric. We'll have a little bit more to say about that phase space shortly. Um, but for now, let me say, well, these metrics, they are generated by acting with large diffeomorphisms on the flat space vacuum. Um, those diffeomorphisms, the ones that respect these boundary conditions and act in infinity, what do they do exactly? Well, you know, and one class of them you can call super translations. They take null time out at future null infinity and they shift it by some function of theta. It's like an angle dependent time translation. Those are the super translations. Those include the ordinary translations, um, R2, comma, one. Um, but there's also, you know, many, many more. Um, they include reparameterizations of the circle, the spatial circle at infinity. And those are the super rotations. And these include um, the two plus one dimensional Lorentz group as a subgroup. Okay. Um, for flux fluctuations around empty space, around the vacuum, um, the modes of P and J, uh, those generate a symmetry algebra and whose associated group um, you could call BMS3 with a hat over it because it's centrally extended. And what are the commutation relations that define this, uh, this algebra? Well, they're, uh, they're here. So modes of P all commute with each other. P commutes with, with J up to a P plus a central term. That looks an awful lot like the central extension of the Virasoro algebra. Um, and the J's meet with each other up to, uh, you know, the J's form a DeWitt subalgebra. Where do, how do you compute this? Well, you uh, construct the corresponding uh, surface charges in GR, and you use the, how to say, there, there's techniques going back to uh, Brown and Hanau for how you compute the algebra of such charges using the symplectic structure of uh, ordinary GR. This algebra uh, that you uncover, it's a bit funny at first sight. It's um, maybe it helps you feel a bit better about it, give you some intuition about it. It's a Wigner contraction of two copies of Virasoro. And in fact, you can get it by uh, taking the conformal group, uh, the you know, two copies of Virasoro and one plus one, um, and taking a certain uh, large radius limit of that. Of the that, of that two copies of Virasoro. Now, uh, oh, go ahead. Mm -hmm. uh, how does dimensional analysis work out? So here, the central term is dimension full. Yes. Um, how does that come about? It's just because. Um, how does it come about? Um, the way how to say um, it is consistent with dimensional analysis. So <laughs> uh, 
Uh, how, let's see, what's an easy way to see that? Um, so J has the unit, let's see, so we can look at the metric here. Um, J has the units of uh, time translations or of time rather. And so, um, and P has the units of uh, one over square root of time. So, or sorry, um, let's see, G has the units of one, it, it does work out. Sorry, if you keep track of how G, P, and J appear here, you find that P and J have opposite dimensions to each other, such that P, J is dimension, or sorry, um, P, J has dimensions of one over G. You just rescale P and don't touch J, and then if you can get this dimension four bar meter in central. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. From the point of view of um, you know surface charges of uh, of GR, it it works out. Um, I mean, it it basically just comes about because there's a one over G out in front of the uh, the Einstein Hilbert action. Um, if you get this from uh, two copies of Virasoro, then what hat? How to say? Maybe a comment on that. Um, there you introduce if you if you keep track of the ADS radius L. Then the original central charge of you know ADS three gravity with uh, radius L is three L over two G Newton. Um, but what happens uh, is that when you take a large radius limit, you have to rescale your generators appropriately to have a smooth uh, L to infinity limit, and that ends up giving you a you know the, the effect in the generators is you get a factor of one over L such that you know you. Um, Factors of L cancel, and you're just left with the one over G. I'm not sure that's completely satisfactory, but it does. If you, it's not, it's not a, it's, it's not an annoying thing. Play with it for a few minutes, and you'll see it that it works out just fine. Um, one comment that's worth making is that uh, the P and J. You know, I said these are you know, some on shell metrics, P and J. Um, the most general P and J does not give you a regular metric. If you want a regular metric everywhere, not just out at infinity, there's some constraints on P and J. And those constraints are uh, physically the statement that this metric has to be generated by acting with a large diffeomorphism on empty space. Uh, more mathematically, what this boils down to is the statement that P and J are really constrained fields. They can be rewritten in terms of some uh, less constrained degrees of freedom. In particular, we can write P in terms of a diff S1 field, F of theta. It's proportional to Schwarzian derivative of tan F by two. And to write down uh, the most general J, well, we have to introduce another field, alpha. Alpha and F, uh, so introduced, are unconstrained fields, but they are subject to some gauge symmetries. In particular, we identify tan f by two with fractional linear transformations of tan f by two, and alpha with, uh, well, some linear transform, you know, a shift, a certain shift. What this means is, is that, you know, the most general P characterizing this metric, so called supermomentum, is constructed from an element of diff S1 mod SL2R, something that's very familiar to us from those of you that have looked at the JT gravity or ADS3 gravity. Um, and together, alpha and F, what do they comprise? They comprise an element of the quotient of the centerless group BMS3 by quotient ISO uh, 2 comma 1, the Poincaré group in uh, 2 plus 1 dimensions. In other words, the most general point in the phase space is actually a coadjoint orbit, which is the relation to this meeting. <laughs> Uh, it's a coadjoint orbit of the centrally extended BMS group. And because it's a coadjoint orbit, you know, there's a canonical symplectic form, the Kirillov Costin symplectic structure. I've written it uh, here. 
And um, in the con, you know, that's the same symplectic structure one extracts from 3D gravity. And there's a corresponding Hamiltonian as well, which ends up just being the zero mode of this P of the supermomentum. So the phase space of asymptotically flat metrics in two plus one is a coadjoint orbit. And here's all the data that you would want to know about it. Uh, other facts of interest. Um, one is quantum mechanical. Uh, say that we take this, um, you know, uh, the, this Penrose diagram, the, the flat space, and consider just like the, the future wedge of it and analytically continue the boundary so that it is a Euclidean torus. So just, uh, just the, you, you take some subspace and analytically continue the torus at null and the, the space at future null infinity to a torus, compactify it, and so on. Well, the path integral over metrics that respect those boundary conditions and with the, uh, has been computed by Barnage, Gonzalez, uh, Alex Maloney, and uh, Blasha Oblak some years ago uh, with a very funny result. Uh, to one loop order, they used a heat kernel uh, technique. They get this. Uh, there's a, a constant out front that goes like, you know, well, in the exponent, this is, uh, goes like, this is the on shell action, just the action of uh, flat space, the flat space vacuum. It's linear in the length of time for the torus. And then there's this uh, infinite product where, you know, if we were talking about something like a Virasoro character, it would be one minus, you know, uh, oh, there should be an N here be one minus Q to the N, but here the Q only is, uh, you know, it's a pure phase and only gets a contribution from real part of tau, not from, it's not damped at all. That was their findings. Very weird. What does this mean? Well, answer that by the end of the talk today. So, if, you know, you get some result, but you'd like to say, well, what's the Hilbert space of states? What's the evolution operator? All that kind of fun stuff. And I was, not quite known. The second fact of interest is that, uh, you know, there's a, a known field theory of boundary gravitons on future null infinity or conversely on past null infinity um, that was uh, deduced by Wout Merbus and Max Reigler a couple at the end of 20, or sorry, um, this is not 20, this is not the end of 2019 actually. And, uh, what, how do they arrive at it? Well, if you take 3D gravity in the first order formalism, uh, time derivative appears, uh, there's a single time derivative that appears, you can employ a constrained first approach where you integrate out the time components of fields. You get something analogous to a West Amino Witten model on the boundary. And well, after massaging, you know, what are the solutions to the constraints? You get some boundary model, what is it? Well, it's described by an action here, and I'm calling S plus, built out of two fields, and you can call alpha and F suggestively, that now depends not only on the angle at infinity, but also on null time. And the action is this. It's alpha time derivative of P plus P, where P is the same expression that I wrote for you before for the most general on shell metric. And if you are careful about sort of boundary conditions and gauge symmetries and so on in this model, then what you would find is that this alpha and F, what are they? Well, at constant time, they're an element of this coadjoint orbit. In which case, well, you would say at each constant time, you have uh, integration over this phase space and the, the, there's a time derivative term here which is nothing more than a PQ dot term. So this is, in other words, this is a, uh, the action that you get from a principal derivation from 3D gravity is the path integral quantization of the phase space that one finds in classical gravity. And for them at the time, it wasn't completely clear how to actually perform the path integral over the various fields appearing here. Listen, I mean, this is classical. This is an action which is living on boundary in three dimensions. Um, yes. From the three dimensional point of view, you are not going to quantize it. These are just the classical background values of the fields. Yeah. And 
is classical. Symmetry is classical. You know, we are not integrating over boundary fields. If we, if we do that, then we are not doing uh, anything in the gravity theory. It's just the classical. Uh, yeah. So far, what I so far this is what I presented as classical. But the the what are these? How to say what are these fluctuations of alpha and f? They are things that um, you know. Uh, if you've track, if you keep track of what they correspond to in terms of metric fluctuations, there are things that are not fixed by the boundary conditions. Alpha and f are not fixed by boundary conditions. You're supposed to integrate over them. Well, they're bulk fields. Then. They just happen to. Okay. Yeah, you can think of them as the only, as bulk fields, but the only part of them that survives uh, after gauge fixing are boundary values that you still have to integrate over. They're like edge modes. Okay, okay. So they, they are actually quantum modes coming from the bulk, but they add the contribution to bulk. That's that's exactly right. In the so inflow kind of thing, inflow kind of thing. Yes. It, it, yeah, these are the edge modes that you would. I mean, an inflow is you know you you can have um, you can have uh, if you have anomalies you can have edge modes that cancel anomalies. But this these are the these are just the edge modes themselves that the that come from the Chern Simons like uh, bulk fields. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. So what I want to do now mm -hmm. is to you know we want to actually path integrate over these fields. <laughs> this is the Boring in an interesting way or interesting in a boring way, whichever transposition you prefer. Um, you want to do the integral. Uh, as I said, the action is effect effectively in Hamiltonian form. Um, let's, because we can, compute real time path integrals uh, with a finite amount of time evolution. And these are going to compute matrix elements of the evolution operator. And to do that, we need to fix boundary conditions. And you know, um, here I, I've said, well, basically, uh, U is going to run the the time is going to run over a time. Let's call it big T. And there's a circle. And what are the boundary conditions that we can fix? Well, there's a whole way of determining what are the acceptable boundary conditions. Basically, you demand a consistent variational principle. And that you know, what are there's Different families of boundary conditions that you can choose depending on whether what kind of total derivative terms you add to the action that I wrote above. And the simplest boundary conditions are those where you fix keep this uh, equivalently f on a constant time slice. You fix this super momentum. Um, all other boundary conditions are basically related to this. You know, in, in like if we were talking about quantum mechanics, you can fix q or p. And those things are related by uh, change of basis. And here, the same analogous statement is true. We can fix p, or we can fix its conjugate variable. The path integral then um, of over this with this action and taking care of this gauge symmetry. The the thing I wrote before, where we identify, you know, the fact the fact that alpha and f are really coming from this coadjoint orbit where there's a quotient. Um, that path integral over those degrees of freedom is a, you know, it's a matrix element of the evolution operator in the P basis. In the, you know, the, these, when we fix P as a boundary condition, that's preparing an initial state of a ket. We fix it at the end, that's fixing a bra, which we can take to be eigenstates of the super momentum operator. If you promote P to an operator. That's the thing that we want to investigate here. Um, where we're really getting at is basically, you know, what are the Hilbert space of states and what's the evolution operator in this theory? Um, a comment before doing that to give you some intuition for, for this. Um, the, the classical equations of motion of this model, the equations of motion for alpha f are actually just conservation equations. So the equation of motion for alpha stare at the action only appears here it appears linearly tells you p dot is zero so p is conserved and if you look at the equation of motion for f p is a constrained field so you can't just vary with respect to p you have to vary with respect to the unconstrained degree of freedom f to get the right equation of motion 
if you find that equation of motion, it's uh, that, that this thing J dot is P prime, the angular derivative of P, uh, which means that, um, that combination is, uh, is conserved. So from the point of view of the action, the conservation of super momentum of P is manifest and the fact that this kind of super angular momentum is conserved, that's uh, kind of a hidden symmetry of the problem. And I emphasize this because, you know, these are the classical equations motion, those get promoted to Dyson equations in the quantum theory, so these things remain true at the quantum level. Which, you know, because P is I'm, you know, the, the matrix means that in the evolution operator, this is going to be uh, a delta function in the super momentum up to some phases. So our first approach to find this matrix L That combination that you just said was constant. Or, uh, can you go up a little bit? You froze. Oh, you of me. Are you moving the cursor? Is that him? I didn't see him. <laughs> no, no, are you moving the cursor? Yes, again? I'm moving the cursor. Oh, he froze over there. Yeah. I think he's not reading out the German. Okay. Oh, there he oh, is. Muted. Yeah, can you unmute him or can you tell him? Oh my! Oh, I was muted. Okay, there we go. <laughs> of this combination, J minus U P prime, which is concerned uh, with this symplectic structure in road there. What is its Poisson bracket with itself? Different points. Uh, the Poisson bracket with, um, yeah, I mean, yeah, let's call this thing J. Yeah, some kind of J2. Or, or sorry, actually, let's talk about the, the Poisson bracket. If you look at, uh, you know, DJ, DU from Poisson bracket with Hamiltonian, you get uh, D theta of P, which means that uh, D little J, this combination J minus U P prime, du is zero. That's what you get from the symplectic structure. Well, you see, when you wrote g minus up prime is conserved, I mean, it's what's called the constraint. So the question is, what is its Poisson bracket with itself if it's a constraint on the phase space? And there was the central extension, so I just start worried that maybe. Sure, sure, sure. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. No, I, I, I understand. The central extension term is basically. Um, Problem. Yeah, yeah. Uh, what, what's the statement? Um, it follows from the algebra you wrote upstairs for J's and P's. Remember? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But this thing, if you if you took its Poisson bracket with you know P n with with anything else, you would get something non-zero if n was you know not zero. But because of the uh, how to say of um, you know the central extension has an has an overall factor of n in front of it. It vanishes if uh, you take the Poisson bracket with p naught, and p naught here is the Hamiltonian. And now the analogous thing would be taking the the you know Poisson bracket with l naught in Virasoro. By the way, by the way, this everything that you are doing is actually is doing three dimensional gravity. It just happens to be living on, on the boundary. Yeah. You are still doing uh, uh, gravity in three dimensions. Yes. There are some, some modes there which correspond to the what's called initial data and so on. And some are the modes which are uh, three dimensional degrees of freedom happen oh. to be, as you said, on the boundary. That's right. That's right. This gives me a useful way of extracting, you know, the the the, the data and the two plus one dimensional fluctuations modulo diffs. Sure. It's the only reason is that Hamiltonian is zero. This is pure gravity. It's so, the Hamiltonian is not zero. It's all it's a boundary term. The bulk part is zero, but there's I a boundary know. term. All Hamiltonian is zero. Yeah. Right. It means that there is no dynamics in the bulk. So what right. you're getting is only dynamics of the boundary of the degrees of freedom 
which got stuck on the boundary. But they are yes. three-dimensional. Three, is this a three-dimensional theory? Yes. Sorry, I just got happy in understanding what's going on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that's exactly that's exactly what's going on. This is why. Okay, this is hence why I say it's boring and an. This combination of words hopefully it starts to make a little bit more sense. Um, uh, so one thing we could try to do right off the bat is try to take a weak coupling expansion. You know, we if we when we say g three D gravity coupled to matter, we have in mind that you know g Newton is small, so we can try to work in a small g Newton approximation. Um, something you know uh, that we could do is to take. Um, P1 and P2, the initial and final supermomentum close to the flat space vacuum. And uh, you know, work at loop one loop level, look at small fluctuations. So let's parameterize the initial final P like this. Um, there's gauge symmetries or equivalently P is a constrained field, which means that the perturbation epsilon has some identifications basically um, you know, the, at the level of Fourier modes in angle, we only consider those Fourier modes epsilon n with n bigger than one. And what one finds, I, I'm just going to skip to the end. You do the path integral in this textbook way for this non-textbook theory. And what do you get? Well, you get a result for this amplitude that indeed is a delta function. Um, basically saying the initial and final states have to be the same. If you express it in terms of Fourier modes, it's a statement that the epsilon in the future and the epsilon in the past have to be the same mode by mode. Um, up to a phase, which you can interpret as the, you know, the, the this initial state is an energy eigenstate uh, with an energy that's given by, you know, this. So you can compute the real-time amplitudes in this model. There's of uh, this, you know, this simple operator, uh, effectively the the evolution operator. Um, more generally, you could introduce a bit of uh, you could change the evolution operator to include a bit of twisting. Uh, you know, the analog of a uh, real part of tau for a torus partition function, a chemical potential for angular momentum. And uh, you know, the same methods that you would do would get. You get this basically. Um, you, one way of thinking about it is the, the angular momentum insertion. It's just a rotation operator. If you act on the ket, it rotates its angle theta to theta plus gamma. Um, and then, let's see, that should be gamma n, uh, which modifies the delta function a little bit. But you can interpret the delta function as being, you know, that the initial and final. Uh, states have to agree with each other up to a rotation. If you take the time to zero limit, that gives you the inner product on states. That's just the, you know, the overlap between these. It's the, these states are effectively delta function normalized in the appropriate sense of a delta function on this coadjoint orbit. Um, and more generally, once you have that norm, uh, on states, you can compute, you know, something like the, the, you know, trace e to the minus beta h, like the one loop partition function. Again, if you froze. Hi. It's actually very interesting. It's very interesting what he's doing. He's, he's, because the three dimension is simple, please us. Energy is zero unless it's on the surround. Sometimes switching the camera off helps. Wow. The, yeah, the problem is um, the internet connection here is usually stable, but every once in a while it's unstable. Oh, so it's a problem on my end, not on your end. 
Christian, uh, there's a suggestion that maybe switching off your camera might be helpful. Yeah, I can do that. Let's see. So let's get the sharing up and running again. Oh, there we go. Okay. My apologies for all the technical problems. Again, it would be so much nicer to be there in the room with you. Um, uh, let's see. So you reproduce this e-kernel result. Um, because time is running short, let me uh, let me just keep going. Um, you can do a more sophisticated computation, one that is non-perturbative. In G Newton time interval in question to be very, very short uh, because, um, and then you can you basically get the amplitude over a very short time interval, compose it many, many times to get the finite time amplitude exactly. And the, the idea for that is that if you have a very, you know, it's, it's, it's analogous to what we teach young people when you first introduce the path integral, where you look at the path integral over a very, very short time slice. You know, it's just um, how to say, uh, it's not a path integral in this case over two dimensional fields, it's just one over one dimensional configurations. You basically just have a single time step if you in a time sliced path integral. And, you know, there's some technical details that are involved in computing the path integral in that case. It's very helpful that uh, the, 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 the integration space is a co-adjoint orbit so that you can get to any point in the space by any other by a group transformation. That ends up being uh, useful. Co-adjoint of, you should have copies. I mean, you should have two copies of co-adjoint orbit. You should have two copies of what, sorry? Two copies because you have two Verasaurus you wrote. There's, um, so in this, uh, when you when you take this, how to say the BMS, what what you get here, you get it from two copies of Virasoro, um, but the net effect, how to say, um, there are there's room in the BMS algebra for two central extensions, indeed, but what you get for flat space gravity, one of them is set to zero. If you track what's happening from two copies of Virasoro, it's that C left for us is equal to C right. Um, and then you take the contraction. And one of the central charges that you get after the contraction is C left minus C right. That for us is zero. That's why we don't see it. Um, the other is uh, C left plus C right over uh, what in ADS would be the length. And that's giving us the three over G Newton. Right, so uh, we get this, we can get this um, amplitude. It's uh, this right here. Um, it's still a delta function in fields, uh, appropriately understood. You know, we can work out exactly what that delta function means times the phase, which is saying that, you know, the super momentum states are energy eigenstates uh, whose energy is the ang it's basically the uh, Fourier zero mode of the super momentum. Uh, as an aside, once you have this exact amplitude in hand, you can go ahead and give an exact computation of the partition function of this model. And well, it ends up being uh, an integral, you know, there's a, there's a trace, there's a Hilbert space of states, which we one basis for that is the super momenta eigenstates. Um, so there's a trace, uh, an integral over those super momentum eigenstates weighted by their energy. That's giving this factor right here um, times, well, you know, the matrix elements that appear in the partition function. Those are, again, some delta function, um, except, you know, they're a delta function that relates the field, uh, well, the P of theta to P plus a translation. And well, that's a really funny thing to consider. Um, if you consider a general function of theta and you compare it with its angular transform, those two things are different. They're different unless you know the function is just a constant. 
the result then is that this integral uh, that appears in the, the partition function, it localizes to the configuration p equal configurations where p is constant plus one loop fluctuations around them. So you know that this this path integral it doesn't um, in other words uh, it localizes it can be performed exactly uh, even though there's no supersymmetry or anything like that in play. And I mention it just because it's you know it's a fun fact the the net localized result that you get is exactly this one loop partition function that was derived previously. So in other words, the partition function is one loop exact with even without supersymmetry. Uh, one thing that I found helpful to, to see about this is that the, um, you know, the one loop result I find very confusing from the point of view of a Hilbert space interpretation. It looks like all states have the same energy. And then what on earth do I, I make of this? And while that, that's sort of uncovered now by virtue of doing this field theory treatment, you know, there's a Hilbert space of states parametrized by supermomentum eigenstates whose energies are just the uh, Fourier zero mode of the supermomentum. And, uh, you know, um, the, the angular momentum just does what it always does. It translates in the angle. And that's it. OK, so now that we completely understand the field theory of boundary gravitons on, say, future null infinity, you can tackle uh, pure gravity in all of flat space where there's two boundaries. So if you will, there's a set of these boundary degrees of freedom living up here on stripe on future null infinity. There's another set here on past infinity. And then there's some boundary condition that relates fields uh, you know, in between and spatial infinity. Perfect. You can derive, go ahead. Uh, just to let you know that we're out of time, but uh, if you need a couple of minutes to finish up, go ahead. Yeah, four minutes, maybe two. I'll, I'll, I'll make it two. Um, okay. <laughs> uh, so you, you can get the whole amplitude for all the flat space, long story short. And you find that the evolution operator, there's a Hamiltonian, which is the same thing I've been writing before. And then there's an operator at spatial infinity that rotates, uh, translates the angle by pi that antipodally shifts things. <coughs> Going back to the original motivation, what we learn from all of this is that, well, there are indeed soft gravitons. There's these operators, boundary operators, P and J, that you can insert into amplitudes. They don't correspond to bulk states. They correspond to, you know, they're boundary operators that act on the Hilbert space of boundaries of states of an infinity. Um, did I get lost again? No. Oh, okay. Somehow, oh, there we go. My screen was not, okay. <laughs> uh, now it's, it's in sync. Um, we learned that uh, in, you know, we want to say there's these super momentum eigenstates, the super momentum is completely frozen. This is like some funny, completely integrable system. The soft graviton state is completely characterized by the super momentum wave function. And one other lesson I was kind of happy about from this is that the super angular momentum is uh, at some level redundant. You know, it's, it's just some operator that we can construct <coughs> With uh, that, that's uh, conserved in this model. And now, uh, final comments about soft graviton theorems. Well, that was pure gravity. It's kind of um, it's nice that we can get this quantum field theory of gravitons, that we can solve it exactly, we can compute the amplitudes and so on. But of course, we're really interested in gravity coupled to matter and observable consequences of that coupling. And well, let, let me finish off with some pictures. Um, the first is that there are hard gravitational corrections uh, to amplitudes. So for instance, if you compute you know, the uh, propagator, exact propagator of uh, some matter field, there's a gravitational self-energy correction at one loop plus da 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 da. That's not zero. Uh, it can be compute. Oh. Sorry, is my... I'm all I'm worried now because I can't see you guys that you can't hear anything I'm saying. Okay. Oh, you can. Okay, good. Uh, uh, right. So there's a gravitational self-energy correction at one loop. 
there's all sorts of other things. Um, in two to two scattering, there are diagrams that uh, contribute that involve gravitational exchanges that are familiar to us. They actually take the same, you know, the one graviton exchange takes the same form as in four dimensional gravity, say, it has uh, this S squared over T in the iconal limit. Um, and, you know, there's, there's more ladder diagrams, all sorts of other stuff that contributes. Um, this stuff, I call it hard because it's completely independent of, of the boundary graviton picture that I described earlier. You know, there's nothing going out to infinity. Uh, no gravitons uh, going out to, you know, there's nothing, no excitate. We're not looking at any external lines that are boundary gravitons here. These are, you know, just purely matter scatterings. Um, kind of mechanically, what's going on is that, uh, you know, there's diagrams that you can compute uh, where there's intermediate, there's virtual graviton exchanges, even though there's no propagating graviton and you get you know, non-trivial results. That's one set of corrections that occurs um, that in general is quite complex and we don't have exact control over. The second set we have control over and these are the soft corrections. And, you know, we like to relate it to diagrams. That's work in progress to kind of see how to, to get what I'm about to say from uh, diagrams with gravitons. So let's look at life near future and null infinity. And let's in particular look at the constraint part of Einstein's equations. These become operators in the operator identities in the quantum theory. And we define what we mean by P and J through the asymptotic behavior of metric components. Uh, what one finds is that um, those constraint equations, well, you know, if there was no matter, then one would find the same things we found before, that P is conserved and J is almost conserved. But when there's matter, there are extra contributions uh, that come from um, in basically energy that can enter and exit null infinity and angular momentum that can enter and exit null infinity. And our, what we learned so far with our field theory of these boundary gravitons then is that the soft graviton state is completely frozen away from these matter insertions. So for instance, if we can consider like two to two scattering of massless particles where particles are coming in and out of null infinity, um, what happens from the point of view of soft graviton physics? Well, there's discrete jumps in the soft graviton vacuum as a function of time, the soft graviton state. You know, it's something up to here and then some matter comes in and that causes a jump in the state. You go up to the next matter insertion, there's a jump again, similarly, similarly, and then at the end. And these jumps are completely fixed by these constraint equations, those you can think of as word identities, and this leads to soft graviton theorems. And you can phrase those, and this is my last comment, my apologies. Uh, you can phrase those as, like in four dimensions, as relations between n particle processes with, well, with, here with a, a soft graviton insertion with P or J, and those without. And, well, we, we, we're trying to figure out the nicest way to present this and see if it suggests something like, um, not BPZ, but something like it in 2 plus 1. And with that, I apologize for going a few minutes over, and thank you very much for your attention. Thank you.